Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Policy at DEF CON. This is Navigating the Digital Frontier, Advancing Cyber Diplomacy in a Connected World, moderated by Christopher Painter. So a few announcements before we begin. This talk is being hosted on the record. It's being recorded. So as such, please make sure your cell phones are silenced. <laughs> and, uh, and if you ask a question, please come up to the mic and speak into it so that way we can capture it in the recording. Um, also, as a policy, uh, please make sure if you take any photos, you don't, you don't do so without the explicit permission of everyone in the frame. But yeah, with that, I will pass it over to uh, Christopher. Great. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. And I know it's been a long day, and uh, it's the end of a long day. So what better, what better thing to talk about than diplomacy <laughs> in cyberspace? I should say this is the... Um, uh, this turned out to be like the world's most dangerous panel because two of our panelists had to cancel, one for a family emergency. One literally fell into a black hole, so they got black holed, and uh, they're, <laughs> they're okay. Uh, but we've been able to field a great group of people. Rather than me read their, their bios, I'm going to actually just have each of them do a short introduction that we'll dive into the substance. Basically, this is a pretty broad-ranging panel because when we talk about diplomacy in cyberspace, it means a lot of different things. There are negotiations happening in the UN, both on the rules of the road in cyberspace, particularly for nation states, but not just nation states. Uh, there's a new cybercrime treaty being negotiated in the UN right now, which has, uh, there's lots of different moving parts of that. There's lots of other work internationally. There's capacity building work uh, that my organization, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is doing, uh, and others are doing on this panel as well. There is, um, standards bodies, there's a whole, I mean, there's, there's a huge dimension, which is great because for years we tried to say, look, cyber is important as a technical issue, but it's also important as a policy issue, particularly as an international policy and, and diplomatic issue. Uh, and uh, that was often a struggle. You know, uh, I, 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 for myself, I was in government for a long time, 28 years doing uh, as a criminal prosecutor. Uh, then at the White House and then at the State Department as the first cyber diplomat. Uh, my successor is in the room, I see. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, and, and when I created that office, that was the first one in the world. No one who was thinking about this at the time, but now it's really taken off. There are about 45 countries who have cyber ambassadors or diplomats. So this really has become an issue. And, and one of the things we want to impress on all of you is you may well ask, well, why do I care? And we'll try to like, make the case of why you should care about this and all this stuff that's going on. But with that, without any further ado, let me go down the line, have each person do a little intro from themselves. Monica? Thank you, Chris. And <clears throat> Guess I can't pull it. Okay, I'll just uh, speak like this. Um, it's, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Monica Ruiz. I'm a senior government affairs manager within Microsoft's digital diplomacy team. I'll be very brief in my introduction because I know you're going to um, circle back with um, additional questions, but I will say one of the main reasons why I was excited to join Microsoft prior to uh, when I worked at the Hewlett Foundation, which was my previous job, was because there is a company like Microsoft that has the digital diplomacy team and is engaging in these issues that Chris made reference to. And so I'm happy to dive into that a little bit more deeply. Um, but certainly, to me, it's, it's a topic of very much of interest, and I'm happy we're, we're making space at DEF CON to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Maurice Kent. Uh, I am the deputy team lead uh, for USAID's cybersecurity capacity building team uh, based out of Washington. Uh, it's a relatively new team. It's about two years old, and it joins uh, kind of a broader collection of digitally focused teams uh, focusing on, you know, cryptocurrency, on AI, on digital connectivity, uh, uh, digital skills, all those kinds of things um, that USAID uh, pushes across all of our projects. And I can explain a little bit more about how, what our agency is and how we fit into the broader USG uh, cyber diplomacy and development uh, space, and then talk a little bit about all those pieces as we get into it. So I'll leave it there. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, John Banghart. I am Senior Director for Cybersecurity Services with a firm called Venable. Um, my background includes time at NIST, time at the White House, time at Center for Internet Security, time at Microsoft. I've been at this for a while. I've been a lot of different places. I'm probably the least diplomatic person on this group in terms of my background, um, but I'm going to talk about public-private partnerships. I'm going to talk about international standards and why that's important and why you should care. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Orlando Garces. Uh, I'm a cybersecurity program officer of the Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism of the Organization of American States. Uh, 
happy to be here. I think uh, I, we have to do a lot. We have to work a lot on on diplomacy in the region. So uh, we look forward to have a great conversation. Uh, we in the uh, cybersecurity program, uh, we uh, work in three different areas. We work in policy develop, cyber policy development, uh, also in capacity building, and then uh, research and development. So uh, great to be here. Great. Uh, and um, you know, I, I should say, John, you say the least diplomatic uh, people person here. Some of the some of the least diplomatic people I know are diplomats. So uh, <laughs> probably not a lot. Um, so you know, broad range of backgrounds, uh, everything from public-private partnership in this area to um, uh, to some of the capacity building and regional work that the OAS is doing. So what I want to do is just to set the stage a little bit, have each person talk about. What they do. One of the things I do now is I run a foundation called the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, uh, which is based in The Hague that has a bunch of countries, civil society, companies as part of it that does capacity building around the world, which helps, helps coordinate it. Microsoft is a member, for instance, the US is a member, and many others are a member. Um, USAID we work with a lot, uh, for instance, and OAS is uh, a, a member and partner. So. Um, uh, but I'd like to get each panelist to give a little perspective of this kind of broad topic, and then we'll dig down and put a little more questions and try to make this as interactive in a conversation as we can. All righty. So I will dive a little bit deeper into Microsoft's digital diplomacy team and then um, give a little bit of color in terms of how we engage international delegations, how we try and plug into what is happening at the UN, as um, Chris said, in the context of the open-ended working group as part of the first committee, certainly the ad hoc um, committee uh, focusing on the new cybercrime treaty. Um, so the digital diplomacy team is small and mighty. Uh, you have about six individuals um, based all over the world. So you have one colleague in Redmond headquarters. Myself, I'm based out of DC. I have three additional colleagues uh, based out of different places in Europe. So Ljubljana, Slovenia, Vienna, Austria, and uh, Prague, Czech Republic. And we have one last colleague based out of Singapore. And ultimately, what the digital diplomacy team does is we advocate for responsible state behavior online and also call for rules of the road, um, more accountability in this space in terms of the, the 11 norms of international uh, state behavior that were agreed to in the context of the group of governmental experts and that were then reaffirmed in the context of the open-ended working group. And so we try and provide an industry, industry perspective across these dialogues. Um, and there are different ways that we interact with um, the diplomatic community in the context of international cyber norms. So we uh, try and plug in to, to what is happening in the Open Networking Group. Unfortunately, we've applied numerous times to be accredited, but uh, we keep getting vetoed by a certain uh, country, and so we do not have a formal stakeholder um, you can, role. You can say who the country is. It's okay, the Russian way. Federation <laughs> keeps the you vetoing uh, Microsoft from actively engaging uh, in discussions, but we still have um, found a way to contribute to different delegations that are actively shaping these discussions, and so we have been um, honored and, 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 and lucky to be able to have a not a voice in the room, but certainly a seat in the room. Um, at the same time, we uh, organize uh, numerous different events on the sidelines of open-ended working groups discussions, whether it's around supply chain security, whether it's around the issue of cyber mercenaries, certainly issues that are being talked about in the open-ended working group and how that sort of feeds into what is um, ultimately making part of the annual progress report that actually just came out at the end of July last month. Um, so that's one way we engage at the open-ended working group. We organize side events with delegations. We also try and identify what are different stakeholder communities that we can plug into. So think communities like the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace, the biggest multi-stakeholder community of industry, government, and civil society that is once again, <coughs> I'm sorry for my voice here, that is once again trying um, to, to call out certain behavior that's happening online across different states and how the stakeholder groups can, can contribute to, to more accountability in this space. And the last thing I'll say, uh, we <coughs> share information as a company in terms of what we're seeing in the broader digital ecosystem. So we have something called um, the Microsoft Digital Defense Report that essentially, um, like, it's an assessment of roughly like 43 trillion security signals that we see every day. It's assessed by roughly 2,500 security experts within Microsoft, and we push that out every year. But at the same time, we'll organize different briefings for different delegations that provide a little bit more color in terms of what we're seeing in the digital ecosystem from our standpoint, and how can that 
um, add a little bit more color to the discussions that are taking place more internationally. The last thing I'll say is since the team is uh, all over the world, uh, spread out regionally, we're starting to plug into you know what our colleagues at the OAS are doing, our colleagues in the OSCE are doing, because in large part, different uh, issues uh, sort of resonate differently across different regions, and so we want to be able to, A, contribute to that, but certainly plug in and have clarity on it. So um, yeah, happy to take questions afterwards. So uh, th thanks, uh, Monica, and, and I'd say a couple of things. I mean, I, you know, I know some people in the room are familiar with some of these things. How many of you know uh, what the Open Ended Working Group is? Okay, a smattering, a small smattering. Uh, so what's happening is, you know, now that people have woken up to cyber being an important policy issue, there's a lot of activity that's happening, maybe too much activity in some ways, but the, uh, the UN has two processes going. One is to negotiate a cyber crime treaty, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But one is to bring all the countries of the world, so it's all 191 UN member countries together, which could be kind of a cacophony, you might imagine, where, uh, where they try to endorse rules of the road, voluntary rules of the road for cyberspace. Things like don't attack the critical infrastructure of another country when you're not in wartime. When you're in wartime, there are rules, there's the, uh, what's called the law of armed conflict, there are rules that apply both in cyberspace and the physical world, but not in wartime, it's not really clear. So they endorsed these set of 11 norms. It's sort of like the, uh, the movie Spinal Tap. They couldn't come up with 10, they ended up with 11. Uh, so they have these 11 norms, and they're, they're, even though they're voluntary, they're political commitments by all these countries. And one of the issues is accountability, as Monty was saying, that you know, it's great to have these rules, but if countries violate them all the time willy-nilly, what does that matter? So, so a lot of discussion is around these issues. It's a consensus-based process, this, this group, which means everyone has to agree, and you can imagine, Right now, people aren't really in an agreeing mood on things, especially because of what's going on in Ukraine and, and what Russia is doing. So, so they, they've been able to make kind of incremental progress, but the key things were creating these rules of the road and confidence building measures, which are like more tactical ways to build confidence uh, and, uh, and create uh, channels of communication. So that's what that group has been doing in the UN. There's a lot of stuff being done regionally, which uh, I'll turn to Orlando next actually to talk about and what the OS is doing because they're plugging into that. So, so, but you have these big international settings, you have regional settings, then you have all the other settings. Okay, thank you. So, uh, first of all, I just wanna, um, you know, say that uh, the Organization of American States is the oldest uh, regional organization in the world. Uh, it's the premier regional forum for a political uh, discussion, policy analysis, and decision making in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, you know, the OAS brings together all the 35 independent states of the Americas and uh, fulfills its uh, essential pur purposes on four pillars. Democracy, human rights, uh, security and development. Uh, I work for the CICTE Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism and as I said before, it's the only regional entity uh, whose purpose is prevent and combat terrorism in the, in the, in the region. So we have uh, ambassadors from all of the 35 member states uh, that are representatives from, uh, from their countries. Uh, the CICTE, you know, we, we look forward to promote uh, cooperation and dialogue uh, among member states. And uh, since 1990, I believe since 1990, the organization has been, um, you know, by mandate of the member states, uh, discussing measures to promote cooperation and uh, trust to contribute to stability uh, in the cyberspace. So, uh, uh, specifically, we have work, We have done a lot of work in uh, non-traditional measures, uh, uh, confidence-building measures, uh, and uh, we have uh, to date uh, several, uh, exactly 11. Uh, confidence building measure has been adopted by the OAS General Assembly, uh, specifically in the years 2018, 2020, and 2023. And um, that's very important, and I will talk about it uh, later. And I should say, a CBM is, uh, for <coughs> those not familiar with these terms, CBM is CBM. what it sounds like. It's to build confidence and transparency between countries that maybe don't agree on everything. And even, yeah. you know, even we had this in the, in the Cold War with. Uh, Russia and other countries, so that there was ways, for instance, a, a, confidence, a classic confidence building measure is communication channels, hotlines, things like that, uh, directories. Um, that's one example of something that's practical. It's not a policy thing, 
So everyone should be able to do this to make sure you de-escalate a possible conflict. Exactly. No, and finally, we, uh, the OAS is an active member in all the international discussion, uh, discussions on uh, you know, rules, norms, principles on responsible behavior of countries in cyberspace. And uh, for example, we, we uh, collaborate with the UN open-ended group. Uh, we also uh, SIGTE, uh, you know, the, the Committee Against Terrorism is the uh, GFCE uh, Regional Americas Hub. Uh, we are uh, working to uh, coordinating capacity building efforts in the region and uh, also in the, uh, well, to work more efficiently uh, all together. No? So. And I'll delve more into capacity building in a few minutes. Um, thanks for that. And that's an example of a regional organization, so not you know, in the UN, but all the countries and, you know, and, this, and the Americas have been very, very active for a long time in this, which I think has been great. Um, Maurice, let me go to you next. Um, and you approach this from a programming standpoint from USAID. I remember back when I was at the White House and we did the White House uh, International Strategy for Cyberspace back in 2015. Um, at that time, getting you know the, what we call the traditional aid, the traditional development organizations involved was kind of tough because we're like, look, we, we deal with water and dams and power, important things. You guys, you cyber guys, what are you even, why are you talking to us? But as we all know, those things are now all controlled by cyber. And so there's been, I think, a real, uh, not universally, but I think USAID has been on the leading edge of like bringing that together. So please. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we're working on it. Um, so I will start kind of zoomed in, and then I'll zoom out, and then I'll zoom back in, I think, uh, over the next few minutes. Um, so crash course in USAID. So we, uh, as you can see, I don't work directly in the White House or at the State Department, uh, kind of two organizations that would be leading on cyber diplomacy. Um, we're on the development side, and if you think about kind of the breakdown of diplomacy, international development, and defense, those are kind of the three ways, that we, the three Ds of US government policy, uh, over uh, foreign policy. Um, AID, so the Agency for International Development, uh, is an independent agency that manages the majority of U.S. foreign assistance. So that means we work in 70 or more countries, more than 70 countries around the world where we have offices um, and uh, deliver um, technical assistance, training, food, disaster response, um, uh, equipment um, across a wide range of sectors, so global health, disaster response, uh, economic growth and energy, um, infrastructure development, uh, governance support, so help with, with uh, elections and that sort of thing, um, and, and agriculture, uh, amongst others, um, private sector development. And all of those programs, kind of as Chris was alluding to, some of them, the digital components are pretty obvious in terms of critical infrastructure and that sort of thing. Um, others are less obvious, but uh, you know, helping out developing uh, clinics and uh, medical centers that are working with um, both at risk and you know, kind of regular populations are generating a lot of data that needs to be protected. Um, and so. Uh, we are slowly waking up, rapidly waking up in some cases, uh, to needing to address the cyber risks uh, across all of our programs, um, as well as now considering cybersecurity as kind of a key capacity building sector that we might work in uh, directly on its own. So it's kind of a two, 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 tier, two level path there. Um, so a couple of things have happened to kind of thrust USAID into this now really expanding US government wide, uh, I think, expansion of cyber diplomacy and really pushing it as a priority across all of the foreign policy we do. Um, from our perspective, and this is where I start to zoom out, um, USAID uh, uh, in this administration has become part of the National Security Council. Uh, our administrator sits alongside the, the secretaries and that sort of thing, um, which elevates us into those dialogues, um, uh, which is really helpful for us being elevated in those. Um, the second thing that's really kind of pushed cyber diplomacy broadly uh, within USG is the creation of the Cyber and Digital Policy uh, Bureau uh, at state that uh, Ambassador Nate Fick runs. So that's Chris's now second or third uh, follower, I guess. Um, and uh, so that whole bureau is kind of in charge of uh, implementing and directing uh, US cyber diplomacy uh, alongside a bunch of things. And then the third thing that happened uh, this year was the release of the uh, national cyber strategy in March. 
um, which has five pillars. Uh, they are, you know, protecting critical infrastructure both in the U.S. and uh, in allied nations, um, looking at taking down bad guys, ransomware, that sort of thing, uh, working on securing, uh, mar improving market forces and doing things like SBOM and uh, open source and secure by default, um, improving standards internationally. Uh, and so those first four, uh, the first one on critical infrastructure, we have a role to play as an agency, USAID does, um, and we will take guidance on the other ones. Uh, we don't really get involved with, you know, tracking down bad guys on ransomware. Um, but the fifth one uh, is looking at uh, forging, I think is the word they use, international partnerships to um, promote this uh, overall, what are the three <coughs> words, defensible, resilient, and values aligned uh, digital ecosystem. Uh, and so, that's really where we step in, uh, is being able to leverage all of the uh, foreign assistance resources and partnerships and uh, programs that we have in uh, building relationships, um, promoting USG and uh, country partner objectives, national security objectives, um, and cyber is a huge part of that. And so all of our development work uh, is kind of a key component of uh, USG uh, dipl diplomatic efforts at this point, um, and we can get into that more a little bit more uh, as we get on. So, so one of the, the challenges in this area is, you know, there's lots of different communities that exist in this space. I mean, you guys know this. There's the technical community, the policy community who don't talk to each other nearly enough. There is the economic community, the kind of innovation community, and the security community. They don't talk to each other very well. But also there's the traditional development community that does what USAID does and the World Bank and others do. And they don't really talk to the cyber people and vice versa very well either in the past. That's changing, which is really important. Uh, and, and one of the things that we're doing um, later this year in November in Ghana, in Accra, Ghana, we're having a, a big conference, my organization, GFC, in partnership with the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, and the Cyber Peace Institute to bring these communities together to try to make everything, you know, every country around the world is now saying we need help. Uh, especially the countries in the developing world are saying we need help in, in Africa and the ASEAN countries and others saying, in Latin America saying, you know, we're happy to debate these esoteric rules of like, you know, rules in cyberspace, which are important, but we need help right now. And so that, that capacity building element is uh, drawn through. So bringing these communities together is important, but also bringing like the community here, the, the technical community, and these discussions is important. So the more you know about this stuff, the more I think to the extent you can influence it, you, you can. I think there are opportunities to do that. I would say, however, that like in this OEWG process, not just Moni Monica's group, not just Microsoft, but they blocked 30 different civil society organizations, including mine too. So it's not, it's, there are some, there's some hurdles to be sure. The UN was not built for other stakeholders. It was built for states, but there's still some opportunities. John, um, you know, there, there are a number of things, you know, Monica has addressed a little bit uh, the public-private partnership from, you know, Microsoft is a kind of a unique company in the sense that not a lot are really involved in that kind of policy issue. Uh, it's changing a little bit, but I think Microsoft has been a leader. You, you, you've you seen this, John, you've seen it from both sides, you've seen it from the government side too, and, you know, one of the things, you know, going back to this community issue, one of the challenges I've seen is like when the UN wrote this rule, we came up with this rule, don't attack the certs because they're like the ambulances or the hospitals on the internet. I remember I talked to FIRST, the form of incident response to security teams, I gave a keynote a few years ago, and they had no idea that that was done. There was no connection between the people who were actually on the front lines and, and the people that were making this policy, and that's a real problem. Uh, so you see that all the time, and I think you also see this in standard and other setting bodies, so. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great example, Chris, and I think, you know, it reminds me of sort of my earlier mental model when I thought about diplomacy, you know, it was entirely informed by Hollywood, right? Like I was either imagining these people in suits arguing in these big buildings trying to avert catastrophe, save us from aliens or whatever the case may be, <laughs> or they were good for nothing, no nothings that the heroes could blame. Um, for uh, sort of blame and shame. Um, my mental model obviously has grown quite a bit in a lot of different ways. And I mentioned that I'm sort of a non-diplomatic person. And what I meant by that is I haven't spent a lot of time doing actual diplomacy. Didn't really get started in it until 2013. And in fact, it was a trip with Chris to, in the State Department when we went to Australia. Um, and I actually learned during that that a lot of diplomacy involves good wine and good food. So there's a real upside <laughs> to being involved in diplomacy as well. 
What I want to talk about, though, a little bit is international standards um, and, and the relation to diplomacy and, the re and, and how we can all influence that. How many people are involved in any way in any sort of international standards development? I know there's at least a couple hands need to be up because I recognize people. So every single one of you are a diplomat, right, in, in, to some extent. And you may not often think about it that way, but to Chris's point, there is a bit really often a big gap between those of us that are more on the technical side who are operational and the folks that are making policy and international standards is actually a place where we can do a lot about that. Um, one of the questions that, that Chris wanted us to address is why should you care, right? And so I think as you've seen, there's an awful lot of policy being made about cybersecurity right now. And I was in a panel yesterday and Peter Brown from the UK Parliament made a really, a really interesting comment. He said, international standards are foundational to good policy, right? Whether they're technical standards, process standards, they're foundational to good policy. If we don't have good standards, if we don't have standards that work, consensus standards, by the way, um, then we're not going to have very good policy either. We're not going to be able to educate, inform, or empower our policymakers to make good policy around the kinds of things that we need from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, Standards get used in other ways from a political perspective as well. If you've been involved in standards bodies, you may have seen this, right? Some countries will sometimes introduce standards into consensus bodies um, that very much favor uh, their economy, right, or their region. Um, they may try to stack the deck, if you will, by sort of overloading um, different consensus making bodies or standards bodies to try and drive home the kinds of things that they care about. It's one of the reasons that it's so important to be involved and I was glad to see some hands come up for folks that are involved in it and I think I would encourage all of you um, to get involved in whatever standard makes sense for you, right? So for example, I'm involved with ISO SC38, that's cloud security standards. That's something that matters to me, it's an area that I work in. But there are an awful lot of important technical standards out there, cybersecurity standards and an opportunity for everybody to get engaged, bring your expertise and whether you see it or not, that expertise and what you're doing in that work will inform policymakers. It will give them the tools that they need to be able to make good policy, which all of us want. Because if we get bad policy, if we get bad regulation, because we have bad standards or a lack of standards, international standards, um, we end up hurting our ability to innovate. We end up hurting our ability to be able to protect uh, the companies, the citizens, um, and, and our nations. So. Um, I'll stop there. I've got some more to say about this. Hopefully I'll have a chance when the time comes up. But again, international standards, they are diplomacy um, in, in their own kind of way and super important to policymakers. So just keep that in mind. Great. Thanks. So I want to have a little conversation around some of these issues and also brought into others. Uh, Monica, you talked about all the work Microsoft's doing in this area. Uh, you know, as I said, pretty unique as a company. It's not like the only company that's involved. but. There's not really any other ones that I think is a, are as active in the, in the kind of policy diplomacy space. Why is that? I mean, why, why, why hasn't there been this groundswell? Why don't other companies see the value of, because what's happening, the reason that I think it matters to all you guys is what's being negotiated in these UN meetings, these you know, rooms, dark, well, they're not that dark, but they're <laughs> big, smoky. cavernous rooms. They're not smoky anymore either. Uh, in the UN, whether it's in New York or in Geneva or in uh, the cybercrime ones in um, Vienna, uh, you know, I think a lot of the folks who it's going to impact are not there, and they don't know what's going on. And it does make a difference because when people are writing rules of the road, and those rules are going to end up applying to some extent to you or the countries you live in, and that's going to have an effect. But why? I think you know. Your company has gotten that. Why do you think that hasn't been more of a groundswell with other, other companies around the world? Thanks for the question, Chris, and I, and I agree with you. I think uh, Microsoft has, um, for some time, you know, the mere fact that we have a digital diplomacy team has allowed us to engage in international forums and regional forums more proactively. But what I will say is you're starting to see a trend towards more companies trying to plug into this space. And I've actually seen this more and more. Um, we talked about the ad hoc committee, which is the, the third committee process negotiating a new cyber crime treaty. And you are starting to see companies like Google, companies obviously like Microsoft and others try and actively um, shape and inform a lot of the negotiations that are um, ultimately going to result in the treaty next year. And so um, I, I do think uh, Microsoft has been uh, proactive in the digital diplomacy space um, and, and has been, and, and we certainly plan to continue to. And 
other companies uh, are now starting to to be a little bit more more proactive, particularly in the cybercrime space. I will also say there are, you know, government affairs teams across major tech companies that are also engaging countries directly versus engaging in international forums. So there are there is certain you know engagement taking place, maybe not 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 internationally, but domestically across different. Although in the past, <laughs> most of those engagements have been, please don't regulate me. You know, that, right. That's what usually what companies <laughs> would go and engage on. Yeah. And policy, it's a little more esoteric, so. Absolutely, absolutely, but but there has been that level of engagement, but certainly not trickling up to the international stage. But but hopefully, um, I'm hopeful that more um, type voices will, will get involved. Uh, and in this uh, cybercrime treaty, so that's going to be a binding treaty if they can reach an agreement. Who knows if they can reach an agreement? And the rubber's kind of hitting the road on that. Um, so that will have an effect. We did a panel on uh, digital authoritarianism, authoritarianism and uh, surveillance, and you know how you get evidence and what the rule of law is makes a difference. And so it impacts not just cybersecurity, but human rights and other issues going forward. Um, you know, Maurice, um, as I said, USAID, I think, has been taking a leading role recently in this. It's uh, been transitioned. Um, it's sort of the same question for development banks. A lot of them still are like, this is not our, you know, this is not our hood. We don't, we don't do this. So, so how do you, how do you try to model or get other, other ones in the development community around the world to get in the game? Because this is a big issue. You know, the UN has these development goals. I think, what are they? How many are they? Sixteen? I can't remember. The SDGs. Um, so, and they're they're high. None of them are cyber. None of them are even, you know, digital. They, you know, the argument is, well, undergirds all of them, but there's not even an understanding of that, I think, that they don't understand how cyber security and even digital connectivity applies to those larger development goals. And I think they clearly do, but there's not that understanding yet. Um, actually, uh, Chris, th thanks for the question. Um, I think that the, some of the development banks, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, World Bank, are actually pretty forward-leaning on cyber capacity building. Um, AFDB, we've had a little bit less engagement with so far. Um, I think the key question from a diplomatic standpoint is um, the limitations or differences of the US government directly providing cyber capacity assistance versus a multilateral organization that has you know, various member organizations and partners and that sort of thing that uh, share a wider range of political objectives, diplomatic objectives, uh, than US government on its own. Um, and so finding opportunities to collaborate uh, in ways that still support the national cyber strategy um, are given you know, US government objectives in a given country uh, and trying to align all of those things together is interesting. Um, and that's, I mean, I'll try to aggregate from a lot of different engagements, but um, just to kind of put in place how um, our specific work on a given capacity building thing can play a relatively outsized role in terms of uh, diplomacy for cyber. Um, you know, in a given country, uh, and there's, in this particular example, uh, I have a colleague who uh, is a foreign service officer down there. She couldn't make it here, and uh, she would have been better to deliver the story, but it's fine. Uh, too bad she's not here. Uh, I'm sad. Um, and so we've been, you know, working with this country and with uh, a development bank to think about how we can combine our money to do cyber capacity building. And the, the recipient country uh, is interested in procuring equipment. Uh, for their cert. Uh, and we say, great, uh, we would love to be able to do that with some of our money. Um, you know, our uh, mission director and the ambassador and the White House are all aware of this. Um, there's been, you know, six, eight, ten months of dialogue between uh, the host government and the development bank and uh, USAID. Um, and as we move towards actually moving that money along, um, there starts to be more and more question around, you know, if the develop, development bank is implementing all the money. Uh, what sort of restrictions or controls are there in terms of what technology is procured, right? Do the, uh, the, the, the technologies that would be procured count as trusted technologies as far as our money is concerned? Uh, some, certain things we can't buy. Uh, certain companies we can't buy, certain types of technology. Um, and those, you know, there's a recent executive order uh, that kind of touches on that just this week, I think. Um, and whereas the development bank uh, is able to. Um, and so figuring out how to blend those, mo those monies together um, is uh, 
it's a very much a development challenge, a like gritty bureaucratic problem that is my day job, but not actually being able to consummate that partnership and move things along and respond to the host country's request for help creates a diplomatic issue up the chain. Um, and so that is kind of, you know, my day to day is country X comes up and says, hey, we're interested in getting cyber capacity building. And we say, cool. Uh, are you, you know, do you want it from the US? Do you want it from development bank? Like, are, are you a close ally? Are you an emerging ally? Are you, you know, and, or do you have an existing infrastructure that we can't really work on? And okay, I'd love to do workforce development and Im improve uh, kind of your range of cyber capabilities. But at the end of the day, if your infrastructure is vulnerable, does that matter? Like, yeah. why am I spending money on that instead of directing everything towards, you know, ripping out your cables and putting in trusted technologies? So it's all very much a diplomatic issue, even though it's uh, development at the end of the day. Chris, can I take 30 seconds yeah, to sure. add something? And then Mark, um, so yeah. just, just a, 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 to add on to what Maurice was saying, you know, you mentioned at the start that you can often get sort of multi-organizational type approaches to this. And this is true not just with governments, but also in the private sector. So I'm working with a number of US-based companies uh, in West Africa, for example, not Niger. We didn't have anything to do with that. Um, but nevertheless, we're bringing together technologies, just like Maurice is talking about, um, to try and help these countries build out their capacity, frankly, to help provide options to other nations um, and what they're doing in those countries. But there's those kinds of opportunities exist as well. And collaborating with government, you can still do things just in the private sector on, on that piece of it. So thanks. Great. Uh, Orlando, just uh, you know, um, OAS, there's two things they've done. I mean, they've done a lot of things. But two things that they've done is they've helped countries, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean, develop national level certs. Many of them didn't have certs at all uh, before, and now they do. And also national strategies. Part of that process, though, is you try to get these countries to adopt processes where they get not just the government, but other stakeholders involved. How, how is that going? Yeah, well, uh, one of our main goal, goals is to, uh, you know, to uh, try to promote the debate, you know, promote debate and promote, uh, you know, the, the cooperation and collaboration mechanisms in order to put in the same table all the multi-stakeholders uh, that are involved uh, in the, and, and are part of the cybersecurity ecosystem. So uh, we have done a great job uh, on one hand uh, building the CECIRTA Americas. That's, uh, that's a network of uh, national uh, response teams, uh, incident response, response teams. We have uh, already 41 uh, sisters of, of uh, whole Americas, um, and also uh, we what what we want to do is to promote uh, and foster f trust. That's uh, our main our main goal because uh, right now uh, you know 15 years ago this is just OAS talking about cybersecurity, and, and we were like uh, doing all uh, you know working this uh, first and second generation of uh, national cybersecurity strategies, but now there's a number of uh, international community actors uh, all around Latin America. You were saying you know uh, um, um, uh, international uh, organizations such as the United Nations uh, through the ITU. And then we have, um, you know, development uh, multilateral uh, organizations like the World Bank, IDB. We have the European Union, CARICOM. Uh, we have uh, uh, also um, private companies uh, uh, working with uh, very closely with governments. And so, you know, the policy making processes in Latin America has been uh, changing. This has been really hard because. Uh, uh, there is a lack of capabilities in, in uh, you know, in governments, but uh, you have to be very coordinated in order to get, uh, you know, better results with all the international cooperation. Some countries are doing just fine. For example, Dominican Republic, they are just great because they have their own agency and they do just, they just uh, know their, their specific needs and they know who to call in order to get that done. But other countries in the region, they are like, they, they don't have a, a strong or robust uh, governance models. And uh, so there's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, um, inefficiency there. So uh, we are helping uh, the region uh, 
uh, in order to, you know, to, to um, create the strategic documents and strategic actions. And right now, uh, what we are focusing, um, you know, um, we were talking about, I was talking about uh, the CBMs that uh, the region has uh, um, adopted through the OAS uh, as a, uh, General Assembly. And uh, one of those, uh, most of them are uh, are uh, uh, um, uh, de are dealing with uh, cyber diplomacy. So uh, we are doing a lot of work uh, trying to do uh, cyber diplomacy uh, uh, capacity building. Uh, we have done, we have um, uh, in, uh, we have uh, invited more than 800 official public officials of the region through uh, more than 20 international law and international humanitarian law uh, courses. Uh, so uh, that's what uh, we are doing right now. And I should also give a shout out to a program called the Women in Cyber Program, where there's been a number of countries in my organization that's been helping run it. We brought women diplomats, particularly from Africa, but also from other parts of the world, to the UN meetings. And you know, the UN, not surprisingly, kind of a male-dominated place, cyber, male-dominated field. But now, uh, last year, over half the interventions, half the statements made were by women, which is an amazing sta statement. So that's another part of a, a community you're trying to broaden and widen. Uh, I want to maybe leave time for a couple questions, but I, I just wanted anyone on the panel to address one kind of elephant in the room, which is that, look, we're in a, we're in a tough world right now. There's a lot of geopolitical tension. There's a lot of challenges. Cyberspace is not devoid from contact with the real world, with the rather the physical world. Uh, the way you get countries to work together is they cooperate with each other, and they just don't cooperate in cyberspace, they cooperate on other things. And if they're enemies or they have problems, that affects everything else. And of course, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, has caused uh, you know, even more uh, uh, conflict than usual on these international bodies. Just as a prognosis matter, I mean, where, do you think we'll be able to make progress with those, these big geopolitical issues, which don't seem to be going away anytime soon? Not everyone has to answer that, but whoever wants to answer that or opine on it. I'm happy to answer yeah. it. <laughs> I think I have the least to lose of everybody up here. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, to, to some extent, I think what we're seeing now from a geopolitical perspective is cyber as a national security issue, right? If you've worked in this space, you've known that cybersecurity is a national security issue for a long time. But folks that have otherwise, policymakers and leaders who have otherwise been uninformed about that, now are suddenly informed and now they're suddenly concerned. And I think come, what comes with that is that greater sense of our interdependence, right? And, I was going to say maybe we can treat it like climate change. It's a global problem. I'm not sure the way we've treated that has been very good, so maybe I shouldn't have brought that up. But nevertheless, as a corollary, it's, it is a global problem, right? I mean, the cybersecurity cyber security is sort of like the weather. Like, everybody depends upon it. Everybody is involved in it. And so for me, I am hopeful. I think there will always be conflict. That's just the way it works. But I do think there is this recognition that we can really start to hurt each other in cybersecurity, right? And I think with this new movie Oppenheimer, people have started to talk about it in terms of things that happened there and AI and cyber and all these pieces. I don't know if that's a good corollary or not, but I do think there's hope. I do think we can find a way forward on this um, because it's, it's, it's a mutual problem. We all share it. We can all hurt each other with it. So maybe we can try not to. Yeah, and I just say that, you know, all these countries want to have, you know, digital transformation. They, they, they're betting their economies on that future. But without the security as, a, as an element to help bolster that, that could fall apart. And so I think that's the, the argument to try to advance this. I want to see if there are any questions. We only have a few minutes left, but see, yeah, go to the microphone. So uh, the talk was concerning like a lot of high level policy change that happens from the top down. But when there's a cyber incident uh, from the lowest level, we always start at attribution. So how do you, your guys' organizations deal with the complexity of attribution as in who did what? And how does that inform your policy and diplomacy and decision-making choices uh, in that space? Who would like to jump in on that? Go first? That's a great question. 
I, I think that's a really good question. And um, a lot of the conversation, at least from, from our vantage point, has started to shift towards that in, in large part. So um, I mentioned the Microsoft Digital Defense Report as something that we put out every year that sort of given as a, gives an assessment of the geopolitical landscape. And we as a company have actually started, um, well, have been uh, attributing certain activities to certain um, countries that are behaving nefariously online. I think that doesn't necessarily um, inform what what we do. We just want to share uh, certain insights for the sake of being very transparent in terms of what we're seeing. Um, but it certainly is starting to trickle up into um, international uh, negotiations of what is responsible state behavior online and how that's how that's being colored. Um, one of the key elements in the national cyber strategy is you know uh, encouraging and re rewarding is kind of a that's a loaded phrase. So encouraging and uh, promoting ethical state behavior, responsible behavior, responsible use of technologies. Um, and you combine that with, I think, uh, this is a pattern, this is my observation as a non, I don't know, it take off my government hat, um, that this uh, administration recently has been very forward leaning, I think, in terms of attributing things, whether it's, you know, and, and using that strategically. Um, and uh, if an incident comes in, you know, a country comes in and says, hey, we've, we've had an incident, we need assistance, we're working on it as best we can, um, there is uh, a whole, you know, series of processes that can get turned on. The attribution, and once we find out what's actually happened, is well outside of USAID's concern. That's the, you know, State Department, Defense, and the President, and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, we're interested in repairing and recovering at that point. So, but I, I you know, I, I think that the uh, caution around um, attribution and, and, you know, utilizing uh, what information we have uh, when we have it is, you know, th th there's been a little bit more of a openness around that uh, because it, it, it creates um, kind of talking to, I had the point, um, what you were saying earlier um, about uh, countries wanting to uh, sort of move uh, forward and, and, oh, in terms of what commonalities are there, right, that, that, that reduces conflict. Um, things like ransomware, right, uh, for the most part, once you have an idea of where that's coming from, that is a really shared thing where everyone is getting hit by ransomware. It's not a necessarily a nation state to nation state issue. Um, it can be, but uh, it, that is something where there's a lot of common interest in identifying where that's coming from and how to reduce it. And so I think attribution uh, there is powerful. Uh, yeah. Although I would say that uh, sometimes states act as safe havens for ransomware actors, and right, we've yeah. seen that, and that, that's a challenge. And I also say there's this mystery around attribution. It's a stupid uh, cartoon of the dog on the internet, which people always quote. When in fact, attribution's gotten much more sophisticated. Uh, you know, when it uh, when you, you have when it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. You know, and the motivations of nation states for prolonged conduct are easier to figure out. The question is then, what do you do about it, right? So attribution, by the bad guys use attribution, like the little green men in, in the Ukraine where they had the patches over their arms and say, oh, it wasn't us, unless you have 100% proof. Well, you don't have 100% proof of anything in life. So it becomes, I think, a little bit of a cycle, and we have to act, and it goes to the accountability piece. Let me take your question quickly, uh, and then we'll just wrap up with a panel, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, so I take notes, otherwise I ask bad questions. Um, so the gentleman from USAID uh, mentioned um, trusted technologies. Um, do you have any confidence in the ability of the UN to regulate what the off-duty activities of a lot of cyber warfare uh, members are? So you know, there's a proliferation of, of cyber warfare capability in countries that has a large number of, of trained persons who are ready and capable of doing a lot of these things. And are moonlighting. And they're moonlighting. Yeah. And, and is there a desire to try and regulate that on the UN cybercrime bill? All right, I'd ask anyone to address that and also any closing remarks you have uh, just quickly as we go. So, I mean, I, I'd say, um, you know, there are times when states are responsible for the activity of their citizens, uh, and, and they, there also is an agreement, even among these UN things, that if there is malicious activity coming from your border and the country asks you for help, you're supposed to help. You, you know, you have an obligation, at least an expectation, you'll either employ your certs or law enforcement to help. And when they don't, that's a safe haven problem. So 
there is an issue. We've seen this in countries where moonlight, uh, these moonlight groups are doing things that the state doesn't want them to do, and that is a problem. Uh, but often they're also doing something that the state wants them to do. We've seen that too. So that's, that's one thing I'd say about it. I don't know if Monty, you have anything to yeah, no, so um, I, I think that's a really good question. would certainly echo what you um, mentioned, Chris, but one thing I wanted to say with regards to the previous exchange we were having is that more attribution leads to more accountability. And I think at this point, the conversation has in fact shifted um, to, to exactly that, right? Like there are 11 norms of responsible state behavior online. The conversation is no longer like, do we need additional norms? I know there's, there's some countries that are negotiating this versus not, um, but how can you actually apply the existing norms of responsible state behavior online and hold those that are actively violating the norms of responsible state behavior online accountable for that? And, and the problem is some of the international organizations we have are not incredibly well suited to this. So, you know, the UN is great in many ways because uh, of the participation and legitimacy, but you have the UN Security Council, and if one of the bad actors is one of those members of the UN Security Council, you're not going to get any consensus what they need, resolution out of it. They'll veto it, and that's, that's an issue. And so, so there are limits to what could be done, so I think we have to also see how, you know, what they call like-minded groups can, can achieve. Any other just closing comments down the line before we wrap up? Just really quick on... on it doesn't the, have to be on that issue. Well, I mean, on that issue, <laughs> like, I, I, I can't speak to USG's uh, kind of interest or non-interest or position on wanting to, to investigate a regulator, you know, handle that sort of thing. That's uh, not in my, uh, I don't know, kind of panorama, but um, I think it is interesting, you know, that the situation with the, the, the Russian attack in Ukraine ha has kind of created a whole weird situation that kind of dials everything to not even 11, but like to 13, um, like the, the amount of response from allied nations there and involvement of private sector uh, and uh, then demonstrating what USG can do in terms of response and partners and that sort of thing uh, creates, it's just a very unique case and, and I think fosters a lot of those questions and has kind of forced all those things to the fore. So I appreciate your question. It's a global problem. We need global solutions. Standards matter a lot. Concise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think what uh, the Americas region has done for the last seven years, you know, to agree all the 35 member states in order to, to uh, uh, you know, to uh, take these diplomatic procedures, these routes that are very complex and agreed upon uh, these uh, CBMs, for example, uh, is amazing uh, as a region. Uh, I just want to highlight one of them, uh, is to encourage the leadership and participation of women in the ICT processes. Uh, so we're, we're uh, in the SICTE cybersecurity program, we are working on a very specific project called Closing the Gender Gap in the uh, cybersecurity agenda in Latin America and the Caribbean. We're working uh, with uh, some nations, uh, for example, working right now with Costa Rica in order to uh, uh, include the gender pers perspective in the national cybersecurity strategy. So. Uh, we are very proud of it, and let's, uh, let's see how it goes. And last thing I'll say, I agree that uh, global problems require global solutions, but they also require a multi-stakeholder inclusion. Um, and certainly, as we're thinking about the, the ecosystem that is cyberspace, every stakeholder has, certainly has a role to play in speaking from someone in the private sector. You know, we primarily own, maintain, and operate a lot of the infrastructure that the internet runs on. And of course, government has a key role, civil society has a key role. So meaningful inclusion across different stakeholders. And I know that's an OAS CBM. I know this is something that's been acknowledged across the different um, UN uh, dialogues that we've been talking about, not only in the ad hoc committee, but also at the OE, uh, OEWG. And so global problems, global solutions, but meaningful multi-stakeholder inclusion is what I'd add. Thank you. Look, so I'll just say, you know, uh, thank you guys for coming. The uh, point, point of this panel is, to the extent you don't know these things are going on, they're going on, right? And, and sometimes you think, oh, that UN stuff, that diplomacy stuff, it doesn't matter to me, but it, it will matter to you. Uh, and yeah, sometimes you want to take your own life during these meetings. They're like watching, uh, listening to paint dry almost, but they do make progress and they do set some really important things that people aren't aware of. And I think it's just important to be aware of it. There's lots of stuff online you can find out about all these processes. 
obviously you can visit the sites of my organization, the, the gfc.org, uh, uh, and the portal we have, OAS, uh, lots online about them, uh, USAID similarly, Microsoft similarly. Uh, so there's lots of good material. I also say, I'll put in a plug, I do a podcast uh, with uh, the Center for Security and Internet, or Security and International Studies, uh, CSIS, uh, called Inside Cyber Diplomacy, which I recommend to you. But there's a lot of good material if you want to learn more about this. But don't be either willfully or negligently blind about the stuff that's going on, because then you can't complain later on when things happen that make no sense. And sometimes that happens if this community is not involved. So thank you.